guys, it is April from Getting Her Go With It. Today I wanted to talk to you about all of the books that I read in March. March was an amazing month for me. I read 10 books, which is unprecedented. I don't usually read 10 books. I think part of the reason that I was able to read so much was because I was um, reading some children's lit and I also was listening to a lot of audiobooks, one of which I had nearly finished anyway. I was like halfway through. Uh, so I think that's why. But it was a great reading month. I read a lot of books and I read a lot of good books. I think I have like three five star reads here. So very exciting. Good March. Let's get into it. <music> wanted to talk to you about The Japanese Lover by Isabel Allende. I gave this three stars. I enjoyed this book. I especially liked the beginning of this book. We are meeting our main character who uh, lives at a retirement home. She's still a very busy woman. She uh, grooms dogs uh, in her old age and she had this very um, complicated life where she was madly in love with this Japanese man when she was young but they weren't really able to be together because he was Japanese this was during World War II so as you can imagine Japanese people were not um, very welcomed in America so she struggled with that through her life and we find out about her history, um, what happened between these two lovers, and we find out whether they ever found their way back to one another. So I enjoyed it. I just wished that I had felt more for the characters. I really, really wanted to feel more, but I, I didn't. So I ended up giving it three stars. I'm going to be passing that along to, you know, my local library. Maybe someone else will get some use out of it and love it more than I did. Next, I read Number the Stars. This is a children's literature book. I read this for middle grade March. That was being hosted by um, Katie from Life Between Words and also Krista from Books and Jams. And this was such a nice book, even though the topic was very difficult. This was another World War II historical fiction and we meet this little girl whose family is trying to help Jewish families in Denmark. Now Denmark uh, was occupied at one point by the Germans and this takes place during that time. Um, this little girl has a best friend who's Jewish and uh, her family is trying to save as many Jewish people as humanly possible. And it's about her story and it's about her um, trying to help as well. Even though she's a child, uh, she also wanted to be brave and do brave things in this time. And I just loved it. I gave it four stars. I would definitely read this to my kids. Um, maybe a little older, like eight or nine. Um, that's probably around the age that I would consider reading this to them because of the subject matter, but loved it. Uh, and then I read another middle grade book in March and this was Tuck Everlasting. And I just was blown away by this book. I really loved it. I think this is most definitely the perfect book to read to a child, to describe and try to help them understand the concept of death. I remember as a kid not understanding death. I remember thinking that that was just not something that happened at all. Death was non-existent. Um, so when you have someone or even a pet, if you have death suddenly in your life, there are going to be a lot of questions raised. And I just think this was a great, great book for that. This follows a little girl who meets a family who are 
unable to die. They had uh, drank some water from this pond and they noticed that, you know, they could never really get hurt and they could never die. And it's about the importance of death and why death is uh, a good thing in the end that you didn't you wouldn't want to keep going on and on and on um, and I, I just thought it was it was really so well explained it actually helped me you know and I'm an adult and I, I just really enjoy it so four out of five stars for that one I also read Tangerine and this was absolutely wonderful. This to me felt like Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier met maybe you by Carolyn Kepnes in a way. It's very disturbing. This is definitely gothic romance. It's being flagged as a thriller and I would not say this is a fast paced thriller by any means. Um, if it is a thriller, it's a very slow paced thriller and it's more eerie than anything else. So in this book, we meet our main character named Alice. Alice moves to Tangier with her husband in the 1950s and the atmosphere itself is wonderful. You can feel the, the sand all over you when you're reading it. Um, so she's living there. She's not overly happy. She doesn't enjoy it. She doesn't go out very much. Uh, but she meets uh, her friend Lucy. Her friend Lucy and her lived together during their college years and they had a falling out and suddenly Lucy shows up on her doorstep. This is a really long trip to take just to say hi and she doesn't know how to respond. And it's about how they interact while they're in Tangier together and then also you find out why it's complicated and awkward and uncomfortable. And Lucy is such a fascinating character. They're both fascinating characters. I'm still thinking about this book. I, it's definitely something that you could reread to kind of, you'd get little bits and pieces out of it, I think, every time you'd read it. So I absolutely loved it. I gave it four stars. Uh, but just don't go into it thinking it's going to be this fast-paced thriller because it's not, it's not that. I also read Hum If You Don't Know The Words. I listened to this on audio and I fell in love with this book. We are following two characters in this book. We're following this little girl. She's a little white girl in South Africa. This all takes place during apartheid. Um, so her parents die and she's left on her own and she um, goes to live with her aunt. Um, so we follow her and we also follow uh, a black woman in South Africa. Her daughter goes missing and she desperately needs to find her daughter. Now these two storylines interlink and I've never read a book before that's given me goosebumps. I had several times, I think it was two or three times that I got goosebumps reading this book. And I highly recommend that you don't go and look for reviews of this book because people will give away what might seem like very small details to them. Um, they'll give away things that gave me goosebumps. And so I really think if you want to read this book, um, just go into it kind of blindly. That's all the premise that you need is what I gave you. Uh, it's so good. I cannot wait for this author to write something else. And I believe she's doing that right now. I think she finished her book and she's like sending it to the publishers for review. So it'll take a little while for it to get to us, but um, I'll read anything by her. Anything, anything, anything. Five stars. This goes way up there for best books of the year with like Memoirs of a Geisha. It's right there. I freaking loved it. I also read We Were Eight Years in Power by ta Coates. He is so important right now. I just, I'm so glad 
that he is on this planet in this time writing because he just is so eye-opening. He talks in this book about the eight years that Obama was president and um, some of the chapters are um, articles that he wrote for The Atlantic over the course of those eight years. He gives some perspective surrounding those eight years. He also really opens your eyes to the history of racism um, and how black people have been treated over decades. And I, I didn't know so many things in this book. I had no idea that black people had such a difficult time getting property. Um, buying houses was like next to impossible. Um, if you were black living in Chicago, it was just brutal. Um, there were like landlords, they would sell a home to a black person and make them pay monthly. And if that black person missed one payment, they no longer had their house. Even if you had spent $50,000 on your house, you suddenly didn't have a house because you missed one payment and all of the investment that you put into it is gone. And it just, it's so devastating and upsetting, but it's so, so important to read this book. Um, I gave it four stars. Uh, I think I should probably change that to five stars just because I just loved it. I just think it's such an important read. So if you haven't read We Were Eight Years in Power, I highly recommend you do. I listened to it on audio and I really enjoyed that. It wasn't ta Coates who narrated it. I don't remember who it was, but he did a really great job. So definitely recommend that one. I also read Everyone Brave is Forgiven by Chris Cleave. This is a World War II fiction about uh, three people uh, who lived during World War II and some of them were civilians, teachers, and others were people who went into the army and were on the front lines. And it's kind of an everyday account of what it would be like if you lived in England during World War II. I loved so many parts of this. I really enjoyed that everyday vibe. Um, I think a lot of the time when you're reading World War II fiction, everyone is a hero that you're reading about and that's just not, that's not realistic, is it? it people are people and cared about their hair and cared about their dates and like, still lived a somewhat normal life sometimes in World War II with this like crazy background. Um, so I, I enjoyed that. I, I did find them sometimes a little too flippant um, about their relationships with one another. I found that strangely flippant. Uh, I really enjoyed the, uh, the bombings. This sounds terrible. That's, I feel like, that sounds really bad. I don't mean that I enjoyed reading about bombings, but I, I found it so realistic. I felt like I was there when the bombs were dropping on London. And uh, I thought that was really well done. I liked how, you know, some of our main characters might be talking to someone one minute and then suddenly they're gone the next. I thought that was really realistic. Like usually in World War II fiction, you'll be reading about someone and you can have a sense that they're going to die and there's this big build up and so I think that kind of removes you from how it would actually be and it dramatizes it um, and in this book it was very much like you're talking to them about their shoes uh, in one second and then suddenly they're gone and I think that was really how it would be uh, but of course that's me imagining how it would be and I didn't experience that so maybe not but I did enjoy it I just wish that I loved the characters more um, I, so I struggled with that I gave it three stars in the end next I read Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen it is it's been such a long time since I've read Austen and I really enjoy Austen now I uh, listened to this on audiobook and I think I'm going to listen to the classics a lot more 
Now, I think I found my groove. Sometimes I can find it hard to go back to the classics. Even though I was an English Lit major, I still sometimes find it a little bit hard. Some of the stories can just take more time to get into. And especially Austin, I mean, the, the way that they speak to each other is entirely different from how we speak to each other now. But I love her wit. I love the dialogue. And listening to it on audio was wonderful. So I am not going to hesitate. I think I have two more Austins that I haven't read now. Yeah, I think there's only two left. Emma and Mansfield Park. I think that's it. And then it'll be over. That's really sad. And what's great is I think I'm going to leave Mansfield Park to the end because I know nothing about Mansfield Park. I've watched the movie Emma, um, and I had watched the movie Sense and Sensibility, and um, so you get a feel for the storyline, but Mansfield Park I haven't, so I think I'm gonna leave that to the end. All that to say, loved Sense and Sensibility, gave it four stars. Okay, so we're at the final two. I read The Cabin at the End of the World by Paul Tremblay. This is coming out in June, and this blew me away. I gave it five stars. It was fantastic. Paul Tremblay gets into your head in a way that no one else can. Uh, Tremblay is really good um, at making you question yourself, just like the characters are questioning themselves. If you don't like kind of open-ended endings, open-ended storylines in general, I don't think Paul Tremblay is for you. He is a master at making you second guess yourself and second guess the story. And I, I just love that personally. But if you're into black and white, don't don't pick him up. Uh, I love gray. This is about a little girl named Wen. She is at a cabin with her two dads. They've rented this little cabin in the woods and she is collecting grasshoppers and this man suddenly appears on the driveway and he starts helping her collect grasshoppers and he seems fairly nice. His name is Leonard. And uh, then he turns to her and he's like, "When I want you to know that what's about to happen is not your fault. And he starts moving towards the house and she runs in. She knows something is off now about this guy. She runs into her house to tell her dads. And she says to them, there are these people outside. There was Leonard. Then suddenly he's accompanied by three other people. And they're all wielding these strange um, objects. They're weapons. They're very much like Lucille from Walking Dead. If you're watching The Walking Dead, Lucille makes several appearances here. So uh, they're walking in. They're like, guys, we're not going to hurt you. We just, we need your help to save the world. It's so disturbing. I was sometimes grossed out reading this. It's just such a fun horror book to read. I loved every second of it. Uh, yeah, go and read The Cabin at the End of the wor World when it comes out in June because you will not regret it. It's, I think it might be my second favorite horror book now. First will always be Bird Box, I think. That's just solidified, but this was fantastic. I also read Unraveling Oliver by Liz Nugent. I gave this one four stars. Absolutely loved it. This is being um, thrown into the thriller category and frankly I understand why but I, I wouldn't put it in that category. I wouldn't know where to put this. I would have no idea. We follow Oliver and he has uh, gone a little crazy. He has beat his wife, Alice, into a coma. And in this book, we are literally unraveling Oliver. I think that is the best title. It's really accurate. You are unraveling him. You meet him from many different perspectives. You read from Al Oliver's perspective. You also read from several people who knew Oliver um, at present, knew him as a child, 
uh, and you also meet people who knew Alice really well. And, you know, this man is a psychopath, uh, but often psychopaths can be very charming. And you unravel, like, who this man is, why he has rationalized what he's done. And there are just tons of layers in here um, about Oliver. And I, I really enjoyed it. I also found it really fascinating that there was a little bit of historical fiction thrown in here taking place in France. Did not expect that at all. Uh, so I, I am so eager to read anything by Liz Newton. If you are up for a slower paced thriller, although I read this in two days, it's very short, but, um, but if you're up for a slower paced mystery thriller, um, about a psychopath, um, if you like character studies, um, I think that you would like this. So yes, four stars for sure. And those are all the books I read in March. I had such a great month. I'm really, really thrilled. And I feel like April is going to be just as good. So what was the best book that you read in March? I would love to know. And I hope you're doing well and I'll see you later. Bye guys.